what's up, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast uh, in all of history. I almost wept. I almost shed a single tear knowing that uh, it's all ending very soon as far as the podcast goes. Uh, as we've said before, this is the last season of the podcast. It's been wonderful. It's been a wonderful ride. The Sons of History will continue. Um, but nonetheless, you, you know, you know, the, the who had, the who had many years of farewell tours. So, you know, I'm not too concerned about, you know, saying goodbye and all that in terms of the podcast, not the, not the sons of history, but you know, sorry, Alan, I, uh, I forgot you were there. I noticed you didn't introduce me. You may go now. Huh? Tombstone. Uh, yeah, I know. I, uh, I did that on purpose to see how you would react. I wasn't sure if you would, you'd flip out, cuss your head off, wave one of your guns. No, I figured you could sit there and go, are you going to even participate in this show or am I going to do all the work? So that's why I, I thought it was necessary for me to interrupt you at that point. Well, good, good for you. Good for you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't yet, do us a huge favor. Nonetheless, subscribe. We're on uh, YouTube. Subscribe to us, leave a like and a comment, um, and more on on the YouTube channel. We're actually going to be taking sections of our previous of our many previous uh, episodes. We're going to be cutting them up, and we're still going to be posting. So our YouTube channel is still going to be active. And so, if you're wanting information on sp specific topics, it's sort of like the Joe Rogan clips. You know, they do like these 10, 15 minute clips. So that's what it'll be like. It'll be, and we're still going to be putting that stuff up. So we're still going to be busy and we're actually going to be doing other things, other work history related. So this is not the end of us. We've only just begun as the carpenters would say. And if you're listening strictly on the audio podcast, like Apple or Spotify, well, we're not going to be doing that. Uh, so, but Nonetheless, leave us a rating and review, five stars if you don't mind, and subscribe. Tell your friends and family about us. Let them catch up on the, which by the end of it will be 200 plus episodes. Um, so, Alan. 200 plus, that's wow. Yeah, it's pretty great. So check this out. Today, I'm, I'm here at the house. I'm about to uh, cook lunch, and I, I eat a late lunch every day. So... When we're going to record on my door, I post a piece of paper that says, recording, please do not disturb. Ding dong, somebody rings the doorbell. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, you, you got to be kidding. And so I walk up and I'm like ticked because luckily, you know, we hadn't started recording. I'm like, the sign clearly says, recording, please do not disturb. And yet you ring the doorbell and Madison, she just goes berserk. So she starts barking and acting the fool. And I'm like, bro, can you not? And he's like, sorry. Um, and so he's like the, the fiber optics guy. And I have the box in my backyard. And so he went into the backyard. But I'm like, this is what irritates me about where we are as a society. Your private property is really not your own. It belongs to not just another person, but other people. Uh -huh. And those people could be criminals. You never know. I was just irritated. I wanted to tell you that. Uh, you know, look, I, I've got stories of my own, but um, I, I really can't. I really can't say what they are. I'll have to tell you one of these days. But uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Trust Off me on this air. one. This is a story I cannot, I cannot say online. Okay. Well, we'll just uh, off the record. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and it, it's one of those. Don't even bring your phone. Leave it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I know exactly where this is going. All right. Um, by the way, did you happen to watch No Time to Die? Because I know you got the movie. No, I. Actually, I've been these last couple of days. I've been watching Zodiac. Have you seen that one with Jake Gyllenhaal and um, Mark Ruffalo? Yeah, the the movie. Uh, it's taking you days to watch it. What do you do? Do you break it up into like two and threes? 
No, nah, I watched it. I, I watched. Uh, I watched it the first time, and I was very intrigued by it. And so I went back and watched it in bits to kind of get, you know, because I lived in uh, I lived in San Francisco for one year with my brother back in '92, and I I didn't even know that I was living only like a mile away from where you know the Zodiac killed one of his victims. Hmm. So no, I've been I've been doing that, and uh, I'm actually writing some articles on the. Uh, upcoming event, the 250th anniversary. Uh, oh yeah, of, uh, of the Boston yeah, Tea Party. So lady, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to be there, uh, shoot us a DM. We'll meet up. Unless yeah. you're a weirdo and you'll be ignored, and we won't meet up. So, uh, so I've been doing that, and I'm also I'm re- I'm reading that uh, that uh, Alexander the Great book uh, by Arian, the Campaigns of Alexander. So, keeping myself, you know, really keeping myself real busy. So, no, I haven't. I I looked at it. I I was watching Zodiac and then last night I went and grabbed a movie called The Bader Meinhof Complex. It's about the uh, Red Army faction in Germany. I don't know. I just grab whatever I feel like watching, but I I just haven't felt like watching the last Bond movie. It just I don't know. I just heard it's not that good. It, there's that monologue that you were talking about and and I did see the ending. I know how it ends. You know, every year I get the James Bond itch, so I watch a couple of them. Usually they're Sean Connery or uh, Daniel Craig uh, Bonds. I, I, I will slip in a Roger Moore every once in a while, or I do like The Living Daylights with Timmy, Timothy Dalton. That is one of my favorite ones. He only did two, but that one was a really good one. Um, and actually I think that was the very first Bond film I watched was the living daylights. Anyways, um, speaking of James Bond, did you get the suit? Did you, uh, go get your suit Tuesday? Uh, got that taken care of. Yes. Well done. Well done. Well, Hey, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be talking about a famous battle, the battle of Agincourt, um, part of the hundred years war. One of the most famous battles of the Hundred Years' War, if not the most famous battle of the Hundred Years' War, thanks to our good friend, Billy the Shakespeare. Um, He did a play called Henry V, and quite good. The dude has talent. He's got a gift. He just just got to apply himself, really. You know, he he just needs to keep writing. He's got to keep writing. Uh, before we bring on our guest, Michael Livingston, do you want to give a brief overview of the Hundred Years' War? Yes, and I do want to remind some people that Henry V is not like Rocky V. It's not the fifth story of a uh, of a long series. So, anyway, <laughs> all right. So, Hundred Years' War. Okay, people are going to be like, okay, who cares about the Hundred Years' War? Well, we're going to tie it in to things that you might be familiar with, because one of the things that we are going to bring up is the movie Braveheart. Because uh, if you watched Braveheart, then you're going to catch on to a couple of things. Now, there was a French king called Philip IV, also known as Philip the Fair. He was famous for wiping out the Knights Templar. Uh, He captured a pope and moved the papacy from Rome to Avignon, France, which is near Marseille. Now, he had four sons, Three of them reached adulthood, and they all became kings of France themselves. However, none of them had heirs. Now, this Philip IV also had a daughter named named Isabel. Now, Isabel married, and here's the Braveheart part. That's the Sophie Marceau chick who marries the real feminine Edward II. Oh, speaking of James Bond, she was on uh, The World Is Not Enough. Go yes, ahead. Yes, 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 she was. So she plays Isabella, and Edward II, he's the one whose boyfriend got thrown out the window. And so, you know, and then the story of that William slept with uh, Isabella, and, you know, they had Edward III, which did not happen. And I'm sure uh, our guest will confirm that. So anyway, so Isabella was a daughter of that king. And when her brothers died, she's like, you know, wait a minute. My son Edward the Third, he has a he has a claim to the French throne. Well, the the French barons and the the French you know many of the French themselves, like the king, the new king who was Philip the Sixth, kind of took issue with that claim. Um, 
Now, Edward III did protest and say, you know, that, you know, France is mine. But eventually he relented and, and he uh, kind of gave it up and let uh, Philip VI uh, keep it. However, about nine, I want to say about nine years later, in 1337, this King Philip VI decided, you know what? I want the, the Duchy of Gascon, which is the home of D'Artagnan, if you like the Three Musketeers. He wanted the Duchy of Gascon, which belonged to Edward III. That was, that was a big holding in, in southwest France. So when he decided he wanted Gascon, that's when Edward said, uh-uh, F-A-F-O. And he took his son, the Black Prince, and jumped into France, started the Hundred Years' War. That is how the Hundred Years' War started. And had a lot of famous people in there, such as uh, Joan of Arc was in that. You had, you had Henry V. You had the Black Prince. Pretty cool. Pretty cool, interesting story. F-A-F-O? Yeah, find out is the end. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, when Edward, the, when Philip the, when Philip the VI was saying, you know what, I want guests going for myself, Edward goes, you're about to F-A-F-O. Because I was trying to think G-T-F-O. Well, that too. Yeah. Actually, that's what they said to him when he said that I should be king of uh, a friend. Now, now, here's another interesting thing is, is that if you look at like the titles of of the kings from Edward the Third all the way up until the uh, the Napoleonic era, the the King of England will say that he was also the King of France, but that ended around the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah, it's <clears throat> very interesting. It's very interesting. That's what happens when you only have a uh, small channel dividing you. Um, and well, anyways, that, that goes actually speaking of like, we're going to be, you know, our, our next episode is going to be talking about what happened well before, uh, the hundred years war, actually about three centuries, three to yeah, about three centuries before, uh, between 100 and 1060 or 1000 and 1066. But anyways, uh, without further ado, we're going to bring on our guest. His name is Michael Livingston. We did have him on last year, uh, to talk about his book. Uh, the battle of, on the Battle of Crecy, but he is the Secretary General for the U.S. Commission on Military History. He also teaches at the Citadel, which is one of the nation's six senior military academies. He is the co-host of the Bow and Blade podcast. He's also the author of several works, including Never Greater Slaughter, uh, Brunnenburg, and The Birth of England, which really put him on the map. The Battle of Crecy, a casebook, Medieval Warfare, a reader. Now, those last two uh, won the Distinguished Book Award from the Society for Military History. Uh, the one that we had him on last year was to discuss his book, uh, Crazy, the Battle of Five Kings, which is behind Alan as well. And his latest work is what we're going to be talking about primarily, but we're going to touch on Crazy as well, is Agincourt, Battle of the Scarred King. Now, on his personal website... It notes that he, quote unquote, stays busy, but he's made time for us. And without further ado, we've got Mike on the line. Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, gentlemen. You're very welcome. We, we're uh, been excited for a little while to have you back on. Uh, we had a really fun conversation uh, last time with you on uh, the Battle of Crazy book that you did. It was just uh, a really memorable book because of all of the changes to tradition, um, traditional thought that you, you put in and the book that you've recently written, uh, Agincourt, the battle of the scarred King is no different. I I'm just like, as I'm, as I was reading it, I was like, well, I think off the air, we were talking about, there was a moment in time where I'm like, this is a Monty Python scheme. That's what they're going for. And then all of a sudden you put in, it's like Monty Python or whatever. So it's good stuff, man. And it's great to have you. So it, Great minds think alike. That's what that is right there, brother. Hey, I appreciate that. Coming from you, <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to complain about some of that when it's my turn to ask a question. So I'm, I'm ready. Well, I was gonna Bring say, it on. Yeah, I was going to say, coming from Alan, not much of a compliment. Coming from you, quite the compliment. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, man. Well, hey, my first question is, uh, so we want to get right into uh, the Battle of Agincourt and sort of what led up to it. 
Um, but why, why did Henry V invade France and what did he hope to accomplish? Well, it, that's a terrific question and a good place to start. Uh, you know, he's recently taken the throne. Uh, his father had usurped the throne and had faced kind of one long career, essentially as king, of uh, keeping back rebellions and assassination attempts. Uh, the, the crown was not incredibly unified. Uh, and Henry recognized, I think, that if he could give the English people a common enemy, uh, they'll stop attacking me <laughs> if we all get together and attack them, right? This is, a, I mean, honestly, kind of a fairly common thing in politics, frankly. And uh, the move, obviously, is to go against France. There is an, a pre-existing claim, 100 Years of War, as, as your listeners know. And uh, let's reopen this thing. And it's a good time to do so because the king of France is mad. Uh, he is intermittently not here. I mean, he's, you know, for lack of a better word, he's just crazy. And some days he is, some days he isn't. You kind of never know. But as a result, France itself is almost in a civil war, which makes this an exceedingly good time to attack. So there's a lot of kind of moving parts that say, hey, this would be politically a good idea. And now is a good time to do it. Let's roll. And, and that's what we see happen in, uh, in the summer of 1415. So we are now, like you said, at the summer of 1415. Can you break down what happens at the Battle of Agincourt? And what's interesting, much like the Battle of uh, Crecy, the English longbowmen play another signif significant role. Um, so give us a breakdown of the battle and then also your the longbowmen. Yeah, so Henry, when he when he invades, uh, he invades and, and tries to lay siege to, he does lay siege to, I shouldn't say tries, he does lay siege to a, a, a small town, uh, it's a walled, walled town, uh, and uh, named Harfleur, and he does take it, but it takes way longer than he intended to take. So at that point, he has a decision to make. Do I go home, having just managed to take this one walled town, or... Do I do as Edward III had done in the Crecy campaign and march across France to Calais, which at this point is in English hands because of Edward III? And it, he clearly decides to make that move. He's going to march to Calais, gives himself eight days to do this. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable act of hubris to think that the French are going to allow him to do this kind of unopposed, but he thinks he can do this. And uh, it blows up in his face. The, the French cut off his march and force him deeper and deeper into France, trying to get away from them, essentially. And finally is, is run aground, right? Tracked down and trapped by the French army uh, in what becomes then known after the battle, the Battle of Agincourt. So one of the first things to sort of understand about this battle is that it is not a battle of Henry's choosing. Henry V is made to fight this fight because he can't run away anymore. He has to fight now. He takes you know, the, the best moves he can at this point. Uh, you know, I'm not here to sort of destroy Henry V. That he, uh, you know, I think this idea of this march was a lot of hubris. But when it comes to the fight itself, his leadership is near as I can tell impeccable. Um, and what happens that day sort of depends on who you're listening to. As, as you said, I kind of rewrite, uh, the traditional story here. Uh, the traditional story has the English beginning the day just north of the small village of maison Cell, and they take position. The French are, uh, quite a ways away. Uh, 1,300, 1,500 yards to the north. And the French refuse to attack him. He knows that every, every hour he gets weaker, the French get stronger. And so he knows he, he must have a battle. If he has any chance at all, he must have it happen as soon as possible. And the traditional account has him march, pull up the stakes that he's driven into the ground to protect his, his longbow in particular, pulls them up, they march across this field, thousand yards, 
put them all back in the ground, and then fire a bunch of arrows, shoot a bunch of arrows, to be technically correct, because they're not gunpowder weapons. There's no fire involved, but loose all these arrows. Provoke the French response. Uh, the French then started uh, charging him, and they all die, because the new position he has is on a narrower battle battlefield, thus taking away the advantage of numbers of the French, and the French are all stupid, and so they all die there, and hooray, Henry is victorious. That's that's essentially the, the, the traditional story here. Well, I, know, I know there was a lot of mud involved, so... <laughs> Yeah, one of the one of the things in the traditional story is that the uh, French are bogged down by the mud, and this is part of how they all die. Um, among the the things that I thought, you know, is is ludicrous about this traditional story, is that for us to believe it, we have to believe that the English could march across a thousand yards of the same muddy field um, with no ill effects whatsoever. Uh, and then the, the French are going to be destroyed by it going a hundred yards, um, which is just ludicrous. They're, they're basically wearing the same armor. So, you know, this, this idea that they are, uh, you know, going to be so ill, uh, prepared for this is, is just doesn't make any sense. Not, not to mention like, why would you, if you're the French allow any of this to happen in the first place? Um, so there was a, a number of, of holes that I, I with the traditional account that I get into in, uh, in, in, in my book. Okay, so now here's where I'm going to uh, bitch a little bit. Now, this is not towards you, okay? Um, I have a book here. Uh, it pinpoints many of the Greek battles that took place about 2,500 years ago. And, and they, they know where the spots, they know where everything, where everything took place, Marathon and Thermopylae. Um, and some, you know, some other battles uh, amongst the Greeks themselves and the Romans. So now let's fast forward to 732 AD, major battles. The Muslims invade from Spain and Charles Martel, the hammer, fights the Muslims and beats them back. Um, I know one of them was the Battle of Tours, but my understanding is they don't know where the battlefields are. They think they know, but they're not sure. So now... I got your book right there on the Battle of Creasy. They don't know exactly where the battle is. Now here's your next book. They don't know. You're, you're stating that they got the uh, traditional site is, uh, is wrong. All right. What the hell is going on over there? Why can't the, uh, why can't the French get it right? And uh, what is it that, that you believe um, challenges their, their beliefs? Uh, well, the first thing I actually say is that book that you held up has got many of those battles completely and hilariously wrong. Um, wait, 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 this one. Yep. Uh, yeah, yep. really? Oh man. Okay. Now I'm mad. Now I'm really mad. <laughs> <laughs> There's this, this lingering problem we have, which is a false sense of security and tradition. Uh, you, you know, because somebody put a, a, a cross swords on a map, uh, made a pretty map a hundred years ago. Therefore, we know where it is. We, we do not. That is that is false. The only way you know where it happened is if you have conflict archaeology. You actually have artifacts coming up out of the ground, um, which is the case for very, very, very few battles. Very few. Uh, now, in some cases, you can more or less... Uh, identify the site because um, all of our sources are in agreement. And even if we don't have artifacts necessarily, uh, there's there's kind of only one place for it to happen. So you have those. Again, I don't know that we could say 100% certain we know where they are. But I mean, you're, you're into the 90th percentile at that point, right? But until you have artifacts, you, you never know for sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, many of those, those purported, oh, but we know where these are. No, we don't. We do not know where they are. Uh, we are triangulating in, 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 in any of these cases. Again, unless we have artifacts, we are triangulating. And the amount of information we have to enable that triangulation greatly varies. So for all those Greek battles that, you're, that that book is covering, often the, like the source is one source. Like we got one guy who says something and he's not 
using topography the way that we do, uh, right? The, you know, Leonidas, the Battle of 300 at Thermopylae, that's Herodotus. He, he does not have a sense of topography like the way that we do. So when he says something, how well do you track that on the ground? It's, you know, people will, oh, I made a map of it. Sure, sure you did. Like, but, but what are you really looking at, right? What do you know about how topography changes over time? Um, you know, Thermopylae was 2,500 years ago. The landscape is radically different, radically different. And, and that's the case even with something like Agincourt, right? Which is, you know, 600 years ago. Like the topography has changed. Now, in that case, not as massively as Thermopylae because of geological forces and the way that the, the Malian Gulf is uh, uh, behaving in Greece. But, but in any case, the, the idea that sort of we know where all these things are and then, oh, well, here's you know, Livingston sort of poking at a few of them. No, no, they're, they're all, none of them almost are really, really known. Uh, that is absolutely the exception rather than the rule. So what I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to sort of destroy traditional arguments. I'm saying, let's look at these cases, right? Let's find the information that we have, um, figure out what information we can glean that we didn't previously have, right? Uh, LIDAR and satellite technologies and our ability to kind of remodel the landscape back through the centuries, given what we now know about uh, you know, the, the behavior of, of erosion and things, we have a, a huge array of tools that they didn't have 100, 150 years ago. And we can kind of, you know, I use the term all source analysis, um, put all of this together and let's look at this stuff anew and see if we can triangulate it uh, with all of that. And, and maybe we'll end up in the same spot if we do, great. Uh, if we don't, well, that's kind of interesting, right? You know, to, to find out we triangulated somewhere else. And in the case of Cray C, you mentioned, and in Agincourt, there's been archaeological digs and they've found nothing. So, like, that's a problem. <laughs> that kind of tells us that we're probably in the wrong spot. So maybe we should look somewhere else. Well, where should we look? Let's triangulate the evidence and see if we can tell and, and put a new X on the map, right? And if we look there and find nothing, well, that's important information too. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely not a, uh, you know, trying to sort of destroy tradition. It's, it's instead, uh, let's be honest about the actual truth of the matter and uh, see what more we can glean. You know, what's interesting is uh, your book on Agincourt doesn't really, like when you're breaking it down, as far as here's where I think the location of the battle took place, you really aren't relying on this high tech, high tech technology, whatever, uh, like the latest technology. You're, it's om it's almost like you could have done this a hundred years ago, and really come to the same conclusions because you are judging by the forestry, the trees that were there uh, then, uh, as far as uh, the density um, percentage wise, that, that would have been there that we, what we've known like uh, 600 years ago, it was at probably at this percentage. It's at this percentage now. And then also the freaking castle, which was one of the things that was Monty <laughs> Python ish. Yeah. It was like Monty Python ish to me. It was like, you're going to let the English, march right under your nose and be like you fellas have a good time out there or you've emptied out this fortress which also would not make any sense and fighting right under it and what's interesting is that you say and you know x marks the spot when i was looking um i i went back and uh, a number of times on your your map number four um in your book and what's interesting is that the traditional spot is X marks the spot. There is an X that marks the traditional. And I'm like, and I, I like wrote that down in my personal notes. It was like, maybe this whole thing is an X marks the spot. This is the easiest way, you know, to just go ahead and say that this is, this is where it is. So therefore it must be. Um, but it, it sort of goes to a question of, 
If you were able to come to these conclusions now with really not even relying on technology, why the hell hasn't this taken place prior? Why haven't people just taken the time to study and research it? And we, we're historians are reading from all of the same sources that you are. I mean, it's to some degree a question for them. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, you know, I actually think about this a lot. I, um, you know, because when I'm working a case, you know, I'll look, a lot of times when I, when I work a, a case, when I'm, and I always, I always, I think about these things as a case, right? So this battle is a case. And a lot of times I work a case and the traditional turns out absolutely correct. There's this, there's like this notion that I'm walking around again, trying to overturn everything. And I'm not, um, it's just that a, a, a book that says, um, that thing that everybody has said is true, isn't a very good book. So those, you don't write a book about those cases. Uh, you write a book about the cases where it does change. Um, you, you know, why has has nobody else kind of done this work? I, I don't know. I think about it a lot because, you know, obviously there's going to be a sense of, um, of uh, you know, like concern when I'm, when I'm working a case. And I'm like, look, all of the historians that I love and respect are telling me X. And I'm looking at it and I'm seeing, you know, why at, like, like those are the, those are the people who taught me, right? Those are the people, those are the experts, like how, how am I wrong? And that, and I really do walk around these battlefields in, in a case like Agincourt and crazy, honestly, trying to figure out why I'm wrong. There's, there's gotta be something they know that I don't. Um, and, and that's part of what I try and explain in the book, right? Is that I try and break down that process of, you know, here's, here's what I'm seeing. Here's how that's not fitting. Um, you know, I'm, I, I kind of try to sort of say, like, I think this is what they're getting out of it, but, you know, I can't get there from here. Um, so then what do I do? Well, then I have to make a new case. Uh, you know, again, it, it kind of goes back to this, uh, this, this sense that of false security of thinking we know things that we really don't, but, you know, we were taught them, right. You know, we saw, uh, we saw it in a movie or we saw it in this book that we really love. We really love this book and it's full of these maps. Um, you know, that, you know, but we just talked about, you know, like it's got all these maps of all these Greek battles and things. And that's, that's this great, great iconic book. Um, surely it must be right. And it's, it's actually very difficult to face the, the honest truth that, you know, these things could be wrong. And if we apply more information to it and look at that information objectively, you know, you mentioned the Agincourt castle. Um, it's not like I discovered the castle, right? We've, we've known it's there. Like that's not, I didn't come up with that. I'm just, I, I'm just like, well, but what do we do with it? You know, y'all know that it's there. Why are you ignoring Ignoring is the operative word. Yeah, as as you said, the, the traditional account has got Henry's left, the end of his left line fixed on that castle. Like, that's not okay. Like, there's, how would the, how, as you said, how would the French allow that? How would Henry think that was a good idea, right? You, you know, you know what we should do, guys? Let's march up and let's put one of the two weakest points in our entire line up against that French fortification. I think this will work. Like, there's no way he would do that. There's no way the French would allow him to do that. So, you know, again, I'm like, why is, you all knew the castle was there. Why are we ignoring it? But, but people did, because if you, if you didn't ignore it, you would have to face the possibility that everything you've been saying about the battle was incorrect. And nobody wanted to do that. And I'm just dumb enough to do that, I guess. <laughs> You don't mind getting kicked out of the club. Do you, do you think they'd be willing to move the location after all this time? Well, there's nothing to move. I mean, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, the visitor center says one thing and you know, so be it. Um, and it, it really isn't, you know, like with crazy, I'm not, I'm not concerned with, with being right. I have, I have no interest in that. Um, I don't have any ego involved here. I, I want to get the history right. 
Yeah. I mean, we want to know the truth. If you know, if you're right, then the truth is wrong as far as we know. Yeah. I just, I just, yeah, I want to get the history. And so if, if, well, okay, that means we need to change the diorama on the, in the visitor center. Okay. You know, or not like, I, I just want to know what happened, man. And then that's, and that's sort of the, the, the end of what I have control over. Everything else is out of my control. So, um, yeah, as it, as it stands, um, Agincourt, you know, I mean, I was, I was there last summer. It's got the traditional story. Of course, my book hadn't come out yet, but I, I doubt that like they're in there today changing it. I'm sure they're just like, <laughs> uh, please, please ignore this book. Right. You know, don't, don't stock that one. It says all our stuff is wrong. I don't know. Well, let me, um, let me ask you now, if we're talking about tradition and accuracy and all that, a lot of people are, are familiar with Agincourt because of, uh, Shakespeare's Henry V, uh, especially the St. Crispin's Day speech. How accurate was Shakespeare and especially that famous speech? Because, um, you know, for me, I consider it as inspirational as, you know, uh, Thomas Paine's The Crisis or, um, you know, some other great speeches that are out there, though I uh, can only think of like the Alamo's uh, William Barrett Travis's letter, Victory or Death. So what's... Uh, Please tell me that he was right, that this was an actual speech that he made. <laughs> no, it's ludicrous, of course. Um, it, it's utterly ludicrous. And, and, and look, I love, I love the speech. I mean, it is, I teach it to my cadets. It's, it's amazing. Um, it's utterly incredible. Um, but Henry V was not speaking in perfect, you know, iambic pentameter to his people. Like, that's not a thing he did. Um, that's the thing Shakespeare did. Uh, whatever speech Henry gave, was not heard by many people because he doesn't have a microphone, right? There, there's, uh, you know, if uh, we don't know ex the exact number, but you know, somewhere between, uh, you know, I favor the lower numbers, so it's just over five thousand men, but a lot of people want nine thousand English. Like who, who here? You can shout all you want. Who can actually hear? It's a pretty small percentage of that. So the idea that whatever he said. Um, was was this glorious poetry in English, which like probably wasn't his preferred language, um, and then somehow passed down to Shakespeare. Yeah, it's ludicrous. Um, but that doesn't take away from the power of the speech, right? The the power of the speech is irrespective of the historical truth. The historical truth is we don't know what he said, uh, but Shakespeare's Henry V has a hell of a speech like there's you know i i i uh, i kind of open with with that because it uh it, it's so powerful that um and in, in world war ii right as they're getting ready to invade normandy d-day asian corps that's what they're thinking about like these guys who are in the room i i talk about this like because we have their their accounts guys who are in the in the room on the the final like, this is the plan. We're going to, okay, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. You know, Churchill, everybody's in that room. And like, one of our main witnesses is like, Ashencore, baby. Like, and it, it's Henry V he's got in his head. And glad he did because D-Day was like, it needed it. And it needed that kind of inspiration. So how did Charles de Gaulle take that speech? <laughs> we, we don't talk about him. Uh, he wasn't in the room. So... Yeah. You know, yeah, the, the, you know, Shakespeare, Shakespeare's just not history in pretty much anything. Um, Shakespeare is myth, but it's a fantastic myth. And, and like, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not to say that it's bad or, or, or it's no different than, uh, you know, to go back to it, um, you know, cause we kind of mentioned it earlier, right. You know, the idea of the, of Leonidas at Thermopylae, like that's, incredibly mythologized and nothing like reality it's a, it's a cool myth though like it's such a cool story it's such a great story um and the, and I, I at least have no problem with recognizing this story is totally untrue um but is powerful in its own right here's the real story and both of those things are okay to exist uh, and i 
I kind of am very confused by people that find some sort of threat in that. Uh, I just, I just don't understand that, but, but there are a lot of people like that and they, 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 they write me and say things to me, but <laughs> Well, seeing that, you know, France would eventually win the Hundred Years' War in 1453, uh, you know, what was so important about this battle and what happened afterwards in terms of the consequences of, uh, you know, such a brutal defeat for the French? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, Agincourt is actually, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this given I want all the listeners to buy my book, um, somewhat of an un- inconsequential battle. Um, he wins this fight, but he's only fighting kind of like half of the enemy because France is in the midst of more or less a civil war. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's fighting somebody with one hand tied behind their back and, and there's not much he can do to, um, sort of leverage this win immediately. Uh, you know, the, the, the moments after the battle is basically like, cool, we won high five. We got to get the hell out of Dodge. Like we, we still got to move. We got to march as quick as we can to Calais. We still got to get away. And that's his concern. Um, Henry V's real triumphs um, actually come in subsequent years uh, in, in the fight over Normandy. And it's what comes out of that, which is at least for a moment, before his his kind of I would say premature death, probably of dysentery. Um, before his premature death, you, you know he's got it won the Hundred Years War. Uh, at least on paper, he's got it won. Uh, but of course, he he dies early, and his his son takes over and is an awful king. And the Wars of the Roses happen, and everything falls apart. And uh, and as you say, the French win this fight with enormous help from a, from a young woman uh, who believes she heard voices, you know, like the whole kind of ending of the hundred years war is incredible. It's really an incredible story. Um, so one of the things I'm working on right now is, is sort of, you know, working on a book that's sort of going to kind of put all that in place. Um, but yeah, in terms of, it's not like Henry V wins at Ashencore and high five, I'm the king of the king of France. That's not at all the case. Shakespeare kind of implies that the way that Shakespeare kind of cuts this story. Um, he, he makes it look like this is sort of more triumphant in the moment. Um, but in, in, you know, point of fact, it really is, you know, I won. Cool. And basically, I didn't die. Cool. Uh, we expected to die today and we didn't. Let's get safe, which is, you know, get back to England, essentially get back to Calais and take ship. And that's what he does. Uh, what's funny is the, when you're saying that Henry V is talking to about 5,000, some people say 9,000 is like, a lot of people are not going to be able to hear him. My mind went right back to Monty Python with the life of Brian and Jesus on the sermon on the Mount. <laughs> was like, yeah. I can't hear what he's saying. <laughs> what is he saying? <laughs> Blessed are the weak. <laughs> That's exactly right. I mean, you know, my, you know, my Python, you know, most of those guys were, um, I don't know most, but a number of them were actually training to be medievalists when the comedy thing took off. Um, and you can, and you can see it in some of these gags. It's like, yeah, they were thinking about how we have this vision of something, what something was, Oh, this great speech, super great. Awesome. Who could hear it? Like, yeah, you couldn't hear it. Um, you know, not to mention the, the milling of horses or what, you know, all the noise of people moving in armor and all that jazz, banners flapping. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't be able to hear anything, but it's a, it's a wonderful idea, right? You know, King Theoden before the ride of the uh, Rohirrim in the in Lord of the Rings movies, right? You know, given his rousing speech as he rides down the lines. Awesome. Awesome for Hollywood. Yeah. It's like, what? How many people here? I know you're a big fan of William Wallace, just like him. <laughs> I want to mention I want to mention something real quick. The, we the remember rou- that the, last conversation. The the, rou- the uh, rousing speech in the Lord of the Rings when um I think the king's daughter was in there and she had one of the uh, el- was was the uh, one of the hobbits sitting in front of her. Do you remember that scene? Yeah. And he was and he was like screaming and cheering kind of like in in Braveheart. 
I thought the perfect thing would have been just like in the life of Brian, where he would stop as everyone's cheering and goes, are there any women here? here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. It no, 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 no. <laughs> Stupid. So my, uh, my next question is uh, sort of tying your, your crazy book and your Asian core book. Um, in your crazy book, you wrote about some of the original sources saying, or at least hinting at, um, a more accurate picture of what took place during the war or during the battle. And your new book does the same exact thing. You, you bring out some contemporary sources that are saying, or at least hinting at a very different, maybe not a very different, but a different picture than what we're presented through the traditional lens. And you used two words uh, previously, traditional and mythologized. And I wonder why is it that historians choose to sort of ignore or disregard those original sources? So you can answer that question and is part of that reason they prefer the mythologized traditional story because it helps for morale, propaganda usage, stories, whatever. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, it's somewhat difficult for me to say what, you know, motivates other people uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but I would, I would say that my impression is that it's not a choice. Uh, the idea that, that people are choosing to ignore um, I think it implies an, an awareness of choice, right? It, it, that I could do this or I could do this and I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to choose this one actively. I, I think a lot of what's happening is, is passive, that, that it's an assumption that there is no choice. We know where the battle is and therefore we move from that point, right? Instead of, no, no, we, we actually have a choice here. That's not happening. We're instead making assumptions. And, and the degree to which that is sort of embedded in the, in the landscape popularly, right? I can't tell you how many people have gotten mad at me, like, like angry. I had one person uh, like threatened physical harm against me for me pointing out that, um, uh, you know, after Leonidas says, Molan Labe, come take it in response to Xerxes at Thermopylae, you know, lay down your arms, come and take it. The Xerxes did like he came and take it like he, he did that like that's a, it's a not a terribly effective rallying cry when your enemy did like okay and they were like furious at me this is how dare you you're so evil for saying this like um, what is the deal I like that's really what happened read the sources uh you know how are you getting confused about this I think for most people this the story that they've built up right the myth it's not subject to question. It's that's reality. And it's a reality like worth killing for because to, to question that reality is to question reality, right? To, to, to many people, it's so deeply embedded. And when you get to something like Agincourt, you know, people have been taught this story for generations and they've been taught a very specific story. And I suspect for, for most people that are that are looking at it the the idea that that the the foundation of that story might have cracks is just beyond the pale right it's kind of beyond conception that's no that's the foundation man you, you keep there's everything's perfect there we're we're dealing with these little pieces on top i, I really think it's a passive thing um and you know i i remember having a conversation with one of my colleagues uh, on the other side of the pond, who is saying, like, how dare you, as an American, dare write about these things? And I was like, well, actually, that's kind of an advantage because because I don't care. Like, I don't, I really, I don't know, I do not have a dog in this fight. Like, all I care about is the facts, man. I don't, it's not like my feelings are hurt, you know, no matter what. And, um, and I kind of like, maybe that's, maybe that's why. It doesn't bother me to to say, you know, well, look, 
here's the facts. And these are like, I'm not making them up. These are the facts. The castle's there. The source says this. Like, that's, that's the words in it. Like, look at the manuscript. That's the words. Like, look at, at two plus two equals four. It doesn't equal five. What do you want from me? Uh, and it, it doesn't bother me to say that, but it, it does bother a lot of people. And I, and I do think it's this kind of passive assumption that we know the truth. Um, and that's true of so many things, right? You can apply this to, um, I mean, you can apply it to here in America, you know, like somebody points out something about the founding fathers, you know, what, what is your reaction to that? Is it anger and like emotional, like, how dare you, you know, that is all right. You're not dealing with facts. Now you're dealing with emotion, right? And those are, that actually says something. I'm not trying to be judgmental, but I mean, just like it says something that that's where your reaction goes. Uh, and it's, and it's hard, I think, for a lot of people to, um, to truly kind of be honest and, and get back to that core of what do we really know? And, or what is just stories that we've all assumed to be true? Um, and again, it's not to say that, that, that received stories are necessarily wrong because often, like I said, you, you look at a case and you're like, yeah, that really is what happened, right? That really is where it was. That really is the thing. It's just that, you know, it doesn't make for a good book. Well, I think, yeah, it's like people don't want to, yeah, they don't want to dig into, like you said, their reality because it changes reality for, at least for them. Um, and then it's, I guess there is the fear like, well, well, shucks, man, if, if this is wrong, then what else could be a house of cards? You know, that's a, that's a, a worrisome thing. Uh, but speaking of digging, you mentioned uh, archaeological surveys uh, have not found anything at the traditional site of Agincourt, uh, which, you know, I think that was for the 600th anniversary you mentioned that a guy was yeah. up there and was like, hey, ain't nothing been found here uh, and I'm like, well, you know, there was a lot of metal there, so <laughs> I don't think that stuff's going to dissolve anytime soon. Um, when you and Kelly, I think it's DeVries, right? Kelly DeVries? DeVries. DeVries, yeah. I knew it. Okay. I knew I was going to get that one wrong because I was like, it's not DeVries, okay. it's DeVries. Sorry, Kelly. <laughs> uh, you and Kelly DeVries worked on the on the Crazy book uh, as far as the Crazy Battlefield, um, that first book together. And you moved the battlefield. Did anyone do any archaeological surveys at your suggested location? And if they did, did they find anything? And if they didn't do a survey, why didn't they? Uh, this is such a good question. I get this question a lot. Um, and uh, <laughs> sometimes I get it rather uh, like, why have you not done it? And I'm like, you don't want me to. Do you want a professional? Don't give me a shovel and have me doing it. I'll ruin whatever I find. Um, no, nothing has been done on the crazy side. Um, why has that not happened? That's kind of a more complicated question. So in France, the government owns what's beneath the soil. So to do uh, an archaeological survey, you have to have um, permission of the, the French government. Um, the archaeologists that I've, that I've talked to have said, well, you know, okay, look, that's hurdle one is you have these bureaucratic layers of you need the you know, permission of the mayor and the permission of the sort of our equivalent of like uh, the governor and the, the permission of the state. Like if there's all these levels of permission you gotta have. And then none of those people are, are terribly interested in- um, Resurrecting a loss, new, yeah. New life. <laughs> How about we get crazy back in the news where we, where we got our butts kicked? Um, and you, you also have to have uh, you know, permission of the farmers, right? The farmers do not want you to find a battlefield under their site, under their farmland, because now they can't farm there. So they don't want it. Um, the government, I've, I've been told, I've, I've not done any of these because I'm not an archaeologist. I, they would laugh me out of the office. Uh, but I've been told they've shown little interest in this. And then even if you had all those things, you've got to have money. You have to have somebody who's willing to fund the dig the survey and that is uh, expensive and in a time when everybody is trying desperately to cut money from higher education money's in short supply so uh so there seems to be a combination of forces working against this um 
I, I sincerely uh, wish that somebody was on that field right now um, doing surveys, because if, if my side of crazy comes up interesting or the, the side of Agincourt, which, you know, the, the, the archeologist mentioned Tim Sutherland, uh, Tim Sutherland, all credit to him. He's, he's the first person I know of who was like, Hey, maybe it's South of where we all think it is. And I was like, all right, let me check Tim. Uh, and I think he's absolutely right. He's a conflict archeologist. He would love to go in there. He just has to have the money and the permissions and all that. Uh, but look, if we didn't find anything at, at my alternative sites, man, I would love to know that. Right. I'm not, again, I'm not going to be like, hurt by that that's more information all right how do we deal with that what then right that is going to be cool so whether you found something or didn't find something is going to be interesting from my perspective yeah i'm thinking that if the french had won those two battles they probably they, they might consider doing that <laughs> yeah i i should probably i should probably grab a battle that they win yeah exactly. and do something uh, but, uh, but yeah, as they say, choose your battles, right? <laughs> True story. True story. Yeah, I, th- I think you should do the one, one on the battle of tours then because they won that one. And I certainly would like to know exactly where that battlefield was. Uh, you're not alone. A great many of us would love to know where tours is. Um, the, we have, that is truly needle in the haystack. We do not have the kind of sources that we've got for Agincourt and Crazy. They just, if those sources survive or, or were written at all, they did not survive. Um, so it's like, you know, you're dealing with a search area of uh, 50 square miles, like that kind of thing. It's not, it's not like Agincourt where, you know, it's a couple square miles. It's gotta be in here somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe even not that it's, it's, it's a much smaller search, search radius. Um, yeah. Tours is, we just, I, I don't even know how it start with the case of tours. It's it is so little information, um, a truly truly small bit of information we have for that. I wish yeah. otherwise because it's so important. Yeah, I, I the thing that amazes me about battlefields sometimes is that you you picture you don't picture just really how big these areas are. When uh, when I visited uh, Normandy and saw the Omaha and Utah beaches. You know, I thought, you know, they're like, right, okay, there's Utah, and then you can see, you know, the other, the other two, Gold Juno, Sword, they're like, right, I didn't realize just how wide that whole area was. I mean, you're literally driving for an hour to get from, you know, one side to the other. Yeah, yeah, so, it's, it's, it, they're massive, massive sites, and, you know, Agincourt is actually kind of a fairly small battle in comparison to something like Normandy, or, um, you know, what we're told about, about tours. Um, probably our numbers there are very inflated, but, um, yeah, they are, these are big, big sites. And, and that's actually one of the things that I, I also thought was odd about Agincourt. You know, we're told this battle happened on this field and I was like, well, how many men are supposed to fit here and how big is a man? I can do the math on this. Will they fit? And what I kept coming up with is no, they won't. Like, you know, you need this many men on this field. They physically can't fit. Like. They're not standing on each other's shoulders. So what's, what's, what's got to give? Well, probably the field um, because it, it is big. Like a lot of people takes up a lot of space. And uh, one of the problems we have as human beings is that problem of scale. It's hard to envision that. So you stand on the field today and you think, oh, this is a really big field. Well, it is compared to you, one person. But compared to 9,000 people, now it's not big enough. And that's very difficult for us to hold in our minds, those kind of numbers, much less those scales. Well, you know, Mike, if you just used a little bit of initiative and raised that fortress to the ground, you'd have plenty of room to just keep on going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That fortress, the, the remains are actually a farm now. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, you can actually see it on, um, on satellite. Uh, satellite images you can see the outlines of where it was uh, but yeah it's uh it's now it's now a farm uh you go into this guy's cellar and <laughs> there's the foundations of the castle yeah somebody beat you to it well the uh now so now the last battle was fought at uh, castillon on july 17 1453 which resulted in the loss of 
pretty much all English lands in France except for Calais, which was lost under Queen Mary in 1558. Now, I contend that this loss led to the madness of Henry VI, which then resulted in the War of the Roses. So, did the... And, and you can correct me on that one if you think yes or no on that one. Um, but I also noticed that, by coincidence, the fall of Constantinople took place on May 29th, same year, 1453. Did that have any effect at all at ending the hostilities, or did the hostilities end because of the instability of Henry VI's reign? Uh, yeah, so a number of things to unpack there. Um, 1453, Castillon is, is an important date. Um, the, the book I'm writing now, actually, I, I, is a history of the Hundred Years' War. Um, and a part of the thing I'm doing there is just setting a fire to the idea of these dates being the hundred years war they're they're not the correct dates um it's a 200 years war uh, and it starts earlier and goes later um which again it's not i'm not doing that like to be a pain in the butt uh, to, to my colleagues or anything like that it's just like you know look what what do you think is really starting this and what's ending it and and the dates you've got don't fit either of those things and curry is going to kill you I love Anne's work. I use her work all the time. It's incredible. Um, yeah, it, it uh, in any respect, 1453 is, is a big event in the sense that um, Cassione is, is, a, is a fascinating battle. Um, and it's kind of a death throw. But I mean, really, as far as things in Gascony, it's, it's over at this point. Um, it, it is just the, you know, the, the death rattle uh, of, uh, of, of the of the dying victim here um but it doesn't mean that things are really over now the wars of the roses as you say um that changes the calculus considerably and i i do think very much that the wars of the roses is happening because of these losses and and that that connection has been sort of people have missed that connection uh a, a lot of folks don't really understand that connection so I yeah I, I kind of fundamentally agree there that that um, the Hundred Years' War and War of the Roses I mean it's really actually the same thing it's just a different manifestation of it. It's kind of like uh, at the end of World War One you had the um, it was the Kaiser Wilhelm was overthrown Tsar Nicholas II was overthrown and then those led into events all. You know the Weim what happened with Weimar and what happened with the the creation of the Soviet Union. So, you know, it's it's very easy to see how that that the loss of that war could result in Henry the Sixth uh, instability. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Henry the Sixth is going to go mad regardless. It, he's that's genetics. He's he's a goner. But um, but yeah, the social sort of manifestations of the anger of the barons and all that. Um, yeah, that's that's all deeply tied to to what has happened uh, in France. Um, the you know Const fall of Constantinople, I, I don't really see has any effect. I mean, um, you know, they it, it's just one of those coincidences in history. Um, but Constantinople is at this point pretty isolated anyway. Um, the fall is dramatic in the sense of of uh, symbolism. Uh, but it's not like it it drastically changes, you know, again, kind of the math, if you will, of uh, of life in England and France. Um, it it doesn't really do that much. I mean, the there hasn't been that much of a connection that direction for a while. Um, to, you know, in in all honesty, I mean, really, since you know the fall of Acre, um, you know, which is centuries earlier. Um, things haven't been that tied to the Levant, uh, you know, from that point, other than some, you know, we kind of, we kind of wish we could head, head that direction. Let's try and help roads, you know, things like that. But it, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of the, the fall of a rear guard that you've already given up on, uh, in, in many respects. And it's still an important event, but it's almost like more important, I think, you know, symbolically and, um, uh, you know, in terms of what it means, you know, for Byzantium, obviously. Um, and it's important in terms of thinking about the, 
you know, gunpowder and what has happened there, uh, which also, again, of course, we see in Rhodes as well, um, you know, with the eventual fall of Rhodes on the second siege of Rhodes uh, some years later. Uh, the gunpowder revolution is important to all that. Well, you know, what's funny is, is that it actually, um, it took a while, maybe I want to say not, not even 100 years, but when Constantinople fell, many of the Greeks migrated to Western Europe and they brought along their Bibles with them. And then when people compared the Greek Bible to the Roman Catholic, the was it the Latin Vulgate Bible? They were like going, hmm, something doesn't add up here. And, uh, yeah, uh, that's actually that's a process that's happening on both sides of Europe because yeah. you know, it's also coming up through Spain. Um, yeah, you're 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 getting these these uh, you know what are we going to do with the fact that the Septuagint, the Greek um, Old Testament, is is not matching with um, you know the the Latin Vulgate with Jerome's Vulgate. Um, yeah, that's a that's a whole other kind of. Yeah, yeah, it's an, yeah, that'll put us in another. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll it's talk, a can of worms. We'll talk about that another time over a uh, beer or something. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what was pretty neat during this conversation is um, you probably already know this, but just but uh, bear with me. So you said X, you know, we we're talking about X marks the spot. And you're like, hey, you know, they're saying it's at X and I'm saying it's at Y. Interestingly, your map four has X marks the spot for the traditional site and your site is a Y. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a, it's a conspiracy. It is a conspiracy. Uh, it's a conspiracy. But not originated uh, by you. <laughs> yeah, those are, uh, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the roads there. And I, uh, I do like what they've, they've done with that map and sort of, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I gave them all of my digital materials um, I do all my work, uh, my topographical work, all in Google Earth, so that so that I can sort of transfer these maps to people and they can they can access them. Um, and they did a great job of, of sort of looking at where I had drawn, uh, where the where the medieval roads ran, right, which isn't necessarily where modern roads run. Um, and that's a whole other thing about how you figure that out. But you know, here's all my data, and then they produced a, a nice, a pretty map that's much cleaner <laughs> than uh, than what I'm dealing with in, in Google Earth. Uh, Google Earth is such a powerful tool for this. It's so great. Hey, hey, can you can you please make it official and tell our listeners that William Wallace did not impregnate Isabella and conceived Edward the Third? <laughs> oh, for the love of oh my God! Yeah, I, I, there's we don't have time for the number of problems with Braveheart. Uh, we simply do not have time for it. Uh, it is it is astonishingly bad history and it, you, you can love the movie again i have no problem with that sort of i can hold these things simultaneously fun movie terrible history yeah uh, both those things can be true at once and uh yeah yeah he's in no way shape or form she was in france and she was i have to look it up i think eight years old at the time yeah she's like yeah eight or nine something yeah so no <laughs> no not at all you know mike you can take our traditions, <laughs> but you will never take our freedom! All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is it. Dude, Mike, always a fascinating conversation. And your latest book, much like uh, the one before it, uh, Crazy the Battle of Five Kings, this Agincourt is just, it's, it's mind-blowing. And for a lot of people, it'd be mind-blowing for a really cool and good reason for some people, it, it will probably be mind blowing, just like an irritant, piss them off, whatever. But it's 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 all good. I mean, if if what we're doing is, and when I say we, uh, you, and we're just promoting it, if what we're doing is actually pursuing accuracy, then you know, like let the house of cards, let those houses fall. You know. Well, you know, the um, uh, I'm going to point this out that uh, Stephen Stephen Harding. There's there's a tradition here in Texas that at the Alamo, William T Barrett Travis drew a line across the sand, and said, "Those of you who are with me, cross the uh, cross the line." Okay, it's a, it's a great tradition, 
But when I asked uh, Dr. Harden, uh, what, was it true? Or you know, before I even finished the question, he goes, no, it was not true. He didn't do it. <laughs> and I'm like, but all these people now are going to be so distraught. But hey, you know what? As, uh, as uh, Mulder would say, you know, the truth is out there. Oh, man. The truth is out there. Has- hashtag facts matter. That's right. Hashtag X marks the spot. Hashtag X files. Hashtag Indiana Jones. All right, uh, Mike, thanks again, man. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for doing uh, all the work that you're doing. I'm looking forward to reading your uh, your new book. Uh, that you did with Mike Cole on Th- Thermopylae. Thanks for reminding me that I actually already have it. Uh, very, very kind of you. So, well, it's my it's my pleasure. Always always a wonderful conversation, gentlemen. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, I know that I had mentioned to Mike and Alan. I showed it to them on our on our Zoom call uh, the map of the X and the Y. But this is this is it. You've got an X and a Y on there. One is the the X section is for the traditional site and the Y section where the A and the B are. That's where Mike Livingston is suggesting um, the battle actually took place. So anyways, I'm sure you were like, hey, I can't see that. I I was aware. Um, But nonetheless, actually, I don't even know if we did that while we were recording. I may have done that offhand, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, X and Y. What are you reading? Oh, you're going through your uh, you know, misinformation? Kind of, it kind of pisses me off to... That, you know, I thought this was... Because I'm planning on going to Greece one of these days, and I want to go see where the battles took place and to find out that he knows about this very book and kind of, you know, shit on the whole idea that it was an accurate book. I'm disappointed and bummed right now, you know? I mean, can't they find anything right? Can't they find any battle? I even read that the Battle of Isis, which is one of Alexander the Great's great big battles, they're not exactly 100% sure that that was the right place that they claim that it is. So, Yeah. I... Now, now they, do know where, they do know where Tyre was fought because Tyre, Lebanon is, is in the same spot. Yeah, but, it's a pretty, op- yeah, pretty obvious spot. Yeah, but you know, very, very interesting. Some of the things that he said because you know, I haven't been to, I haven't been to this battlefield. I would like to check it out, but um, you know, he he seems to uh, know what he's talking about. Um, I I had no idea he was Secretary General of the uh, U.S. Commission on Military History and all that. I forgot to ask him about that. And yeah, I think we might have touched on that uh, in the first episode, but yeah, it's. Just a ton of good information. And that's what I like about having um, some of our, when, when we have our guests on, like we have really just some top notch historians. Like that's why we decided to do this, the Sons of History and, and the podcast and everything is to, as, as Mike would say, get the history right. Like that's our, that's our goal. You're told something. You know, your parents are told something, your grandparents and going however far back, just because it's been, you know, repeated does not mean it's true. It's the whole, uh, if, if a lie is repeated enough, it becomes the truth. And like, whether that's done out of, uh, like sinister motives or not, or whether it's done out of, you know, just ignorance, it still needs to be corrected. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to have, have. Uh, somebody on like Mike who does great work and doesn't care about the pushback. Yeah. I mean, we had, uh, I mentioned the Alamo. Uh, There have been things that have come out about the Alamo, which kind of broke the tradition a little bit. Um, You know, the, the, the line in the sand, but also that uh, Davy Crockett surrendered. Okay. I didn't have any effect on the story itself. Um, he was still considered a hero, you know, and, and you're, if you're surrounded by 4,000, you know, enemy soldiers and there's only about, what, five or six of you left inside a mission church, okay, I game over, man. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> game over, game over. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, they're not going to just line up one by one and let them hit, let you hit them in the face 
with the butt of your rifle. Yeah, it just you know it just it doesn't change it doesn't change the story. It doesn't change the fact that you know yeah, the battle took place. They didn't surrender, and when they got overwhelmed, okay, then that was it. Case closed. Case closed. So speaking of case closed, um, this case is closing. Um, this is the end of this episode. It was good to see you. It was great to talk to Mike. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you enjoyed this episode. We will talk to you next week.